Hi, uh, good to see you today. Uh, welcome to Central Church. My name's Stuart and I'm one of the pastors here at Central Church. Happy Easter. Uh, it's great to be reminded again, isn't it, of the resurrection, uh, just as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15 to the church who already knew about the, the resurrection and we're looking at that passage today. Uh, we're going to be reminded again of the hope and uh, the, the new, uh, new, new and better future that the resurrection brings. Um, uh, it's been a strange term for uh, our family, uh, one of the strangest ever with uh, floods and lockdowns and isolation, that, that kind of thing. And in the world uh, more widely, it's been a rough term, isn't it? Uh, uh, the general state of things uh, is a bit chaotic and that's the theme for our Easter series, uh, chaos, the cross and the crown. Uh, the world's in a bit of chaos in various ways. We've got uh, wars going on. We've got a, um, a, an election happening here. We're, we've got um, takeovers in various countries. There's lots of unrest. There's, there's a pandemic and uh, flooding. And there's a whole bunch of things happening. And so into the chaos, uh, Jesus steps in. And we saw on Good Friday that uh, he's the, a new and better king. Uh, he goes to the cross and uh, does what we need uh, we really need. Um, of course today we're focusing on uh, Easter Sunday and the resurrection and the new and better future that that brings for us. Uh, so welcome, we're going to be getting into that shortly. Uh, first of all, um, uh, if you're new, uh, it's great to have you with us. We'd love to touch base with you and uh, you go to our website centralchurch.net.au and click on new and then we, you can connect with us that way. Can I just mention, uh, over Easter we are doing a bit of an appeal for the work of Ipswich Assist, uh, help, hope and support for the marginalised people uh, of Ipswich. Uh, you can go to ipswichassist.org.au and uh, you, can, you can give there. We'd uh, really appreciate that this Easter time. So that's Ipswich Assist. Um, Let's start this morning with reading one of the uh, accounts, the account of John and uh, a bit of that about um, how Mary goes to the tomb and, and Peter and how they uh, see the empty tomb. So, so there it is, uh, John 20 and verses 1 to 18. Let's have a read. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been in Jesus, on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths but folded up and placed by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and to your Father, 
to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. In response to that, I just ask you to join me now. And we'll, we'll pray shortly. We'll have a bit of a look at 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, think about um, the new and better future that Jesus offers us. But, but would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, we thank you again that we've got the, your, your word to remind us of the good news of the gospel. And, and we pray that as we hear those words again, uh, of, of Mary's surprise, that we'll be surprised, that, that we'll be reminded of, of the uh, delight that it is to know the hope that we have that comes through through you. We pray for the church uh, around the world that, um, that the good news of the gospel would be declared today, that it'll be heard today, uh, that it'll be uh, changing people's lives today. We pray for church leaders uh, around the world uh, Give them courage as they speak. Uh, particularly pray for the, the places where your church is uh, under pressure. We pray for uh, uh, the church in Afghanistan. Pray for the church in Ukraine and North Korea and other places where it's just so hard to be one of your people. Pray for your people though in, in, in first world countries as well where we're not persecuted but uh, somehow we've been silenced. Somehow we've been forced into a, a corner and uh, there are other pressures uh, keeping us from declaring the good news of Jesus. I pray for courage for uh, first world countries as well. Well, Lord, we want to pray particularly for what's going on in the Ukraine. We ask that you would uh, bring peace there, that you'd be working in the hearts of Vladimir Putin and his uh, advisors and in the circumstances and, and the other leaders. We pray that the sanctions would be effective, uh, that there would be a ceasefire from the Russian side, that, that certainly there'll be no uh, chemical uh, war, um, uh, chemical weapons used. We pray for those who are, are in fear in Ukraine, for women and children, for those who are not sure what tomorrow will bring. We pray that there'll be food and medical supplies, and we pray for those sifting through the rubble, uh, through the wreckage, of uh, buildings that have been knocked down, that have been bombed. Uh, think too of uh, Afghanistan, which has not been on the radar so much, but we pray for the food shortages that are happening there in that, that place, for the women and children. Um, Lord, might there be justice? Might there be provision? Might there be some tenderness and some care? And might your people uh, be at work there and might you be at work Lord, as we come to um, your word again uh, pray that you would encourage each one of us in the circumstances that we're in you, you know them you know uh, those of us who have our fears and anxieties and our circumstances and we pray that we would be convicted too um, of the good news of the gospel of the resurrection of jesus on, of the certain future hope that we have and that we would know that our work in the Lord, our labour in the Lord would not be in vain. Lord, strengthen us even as we meet together um, electronically and not face to face. And I pray for your church as they do meet face to face. Uh, might uh, you, uh, your strength be ours and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 15. I'm just going to read from verse 50 to 58. Uh, we will be jumping around a little bit more in 1 Corinthians 15 today. So if you've got a Bible, that'd be great. We'll show some of the verses here on the screen. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to read from verse 50 to 58. I'll tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of, of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable 
when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death in sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Let's pray. Well, thanks to these words, these reminders, uh, things that maybe we already know, but uh, like the church in Corinth, it really doesn't hurt to be reminded uh, again. Uh, in the chaos of this world, uh, help us to see the, the new and better king we have in Jesus and the new and better future that we have in him. And we pray that that might make a difference to how we think about you and how we think about others and how we live now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A new and better future. That, that's the title for today. And uh, I've got to admit, it does sound a bit like a, a stump speech, doesn't it? Uh, Anthony Albanese, a vote for me, uh, is a vote for a new and better future. Now, for him, that would be around a better aged care, wouldn't it? And uh, investment in renewable energy. Uh, Clive Palmer is offering us a new and better future as well. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom and uh, what's, the, what's the last one? Oh yeah, freedom. <laughs> so I guess uh, we're both voting for um, the best new and better future. Uh, now in a way, possibly more than ever before, uh, there's a huge cultural tug of war going on over what the best version of the future is from, from the most strident progressive to someone like a Vladimir Putin and his future plans for Russia and the, the Ukraine. Now, whether you agree or, or, or disagree, I think we know they all think, and even Vladimir thinks, that what, what he's doing is in line with the best future. In fact, I reckon so are you. Now, uh, Griffith University is one of those uh, proudly forward-thinking uh, institutions uh, they're running a series uh, with interviewer Kerry O'Brien. It's called A Better Future for All. Uh, Kerry's interviewing people uh, from all walks of life, like uh, a dancer, uh, Lee Su Sin, Mao's last dancer. He he's interviewing artists and, and writers. And uh, this guy, Dr. Dinesh Talapana, who's Queensland's first quadriplegic medical intern and graduate. It's inspirational stuff and, and Kerry says uh, there are so many what ifs there's so much instability so much anxiety there is no greater time than now for us to be having this kind of discourse well uh, it's Easter Sunday and, and Kerry I, I agree uh, because uh, the resurrection of Jesus has got something profound to say about the future uh, there's no better time to be talking about it so that's what we're going to do. Now, look, uh, although at the outset, I, I want to suggest that uh, this is a new and better future that is true, although that, that is absolutely critical, that's actually not where I, where I want to spend my time today. I, I take the point of a Christian author who, who, who said recently, I don't come to church Easter Sunday to be reminded of the facts, but to be thrilled with the hope. Uh, so uh, though it's true, um, I want to spend this time now on the better part of the equation. There's three points. One, a new and better death. Two, a new and better life. And uh, lastly, a new and better future. Now let's start with the first one, a new and better death. Uh, it's a strange concept, uh, but at the time of Jesus... Neither the Jews or, or the Gentiles had this idea at all, had the thought, had the expectation even, that someone would rise bodily from a grave. 
uh, for the Gentiles that much like for us today, the, th the thought that a dead person could actually come back to life was blatantly ridiculous. And uh, for them, why would you want to anyway? For them, the, the predominant philosophy w was that uh, the flesh and material things, well, they're kind of second rate. They're kind of things that to, to have to endure for a while maybe, but that you hopefully in the end get rid of, that, that you, you discard and not things to be taken up again. Uh, for the Jews, uh, the Old Testament does in a few places talk about a kind of a resurrection, but uh, not quite what happens. Martha, what Martha says to Jesus is pretty much reflective of what the, the Jews thought. You might know the story of Lazarus, who he gets sick. He's Jesus' friend. He gets sick and dies, and Jesus comes along, but it's too late. He's actually died. Martha says, Jesus, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. But this is what Jesus says. Well, Martha says to, to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And that's the Jewish idea. The idea that at the end of all things, uh, there would be a, a sort of a general resurrection. But as Jesus showed Martha that day and, and as he demonstrated Easter Sunday, that's actually not quite what he meant. Not, not quite what he meant. Uh, at the resurrection of Jesus, the, the Jews and the Gentiles, they're seeing something new. Now the Gospels, uh, they put this emphasis on the empty tomb on, on one hand and a, a physically raised saviour. Now why is that important? Why, why do we need to keep being shown an empty tomb? After all, an empty tomb doesn't really prove that much. But I think what it does show, importantly, is that body continuity. That What it shows is that the risen Jesus is the same Jesus that was in the tomb. That, uh, that was him that was there, that, that he's been undeaded. Uh, that's the best kind of dead, isn't it? It's, it's resurrect dead. And of course, uh, that is hard to believe. Uh, you know, uh, at the start when Adam and Eve were, were running around, there was no such thing as death. They struggled with the concept, concept of death because why? Well, because nobody had ever died. <laughs> For us, that's not a problem. Is it? It's resurrection that we have trouble with. And so when Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, he's reminding them of a central point of the Christian gospel that uh, we really do have a new approach to death because of Jesus' resurrection. And that's what he says there in verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? At Corinth, it seems that the church says, yeah, 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 Jesus is raised from the dead. Yes, we believe that. But at the same time, maybe it's because it's such a paradigm shift and because people don't get resurrected. <laughs> they say, yes, he did, but, but, but still, no, that, that doesn't mean there's a resurrection generally, or, or, or for me particularly, Jesus, for them, Jesus' resurrection doesn't break in to my relationship with, with death. So the death of Jesus then becomes, yes, something pretty amazing, a bit like a guy on a, on a motorbike who, who jumps over 15 buses. Isn't that amazing for him? It's not something I'm going to do anytime soon. <laughs> But Paul, Paul's saying, no, that's, that's not it. You, you don't get it. Jesus' resurrection says, you are next. There's a logic here in verse 13. He says, but if that, there's no resurrection from the dead, which is what they're saying, there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. See, see a denial of, of the resurrection accidentally sweeps Jesus up into it and says that he didn't rise. Now, if that's true, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And uh, go on, if Christ has not been raised, Paul says, then our preaching is in vain. And so is your faith. Your faith is in vain. He's saying, I understand this, that the resurrection of, of this new and better king 
It's about your new and better future. It's about you. It's intimately connected with, with you. Now, uh, in Star Wars, it's Yoda who says to Anakin, death, I won't try and do the voice, <laughs> death is a natural part of life. Now, doesn't that all sound very wise? And, and look, Yoda's so darn cute, it, it, it's, it's almost you want to believe it. But when he says that, when Yoda says that, death is a natural part of life, what he's doing, he's channeling a kind of Buddhist, Stoic philosophy. It's, it's one version of a number of different ways that you come to terms with the reality of death. I call it natural, accept it, maybe even embrace it. But Jesus doesn't do that at all. Jesus comes along and says, I've got a better idea. How about we don't? How about we tackle it? How about we do something about it? Our resurrected king, he gives us a new and better approach to death. And so Paul argues it like this. He says, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus? He's talking about himself. He's talking about um, some kind of horrific consequence of him of taking the gospel to, to Ephesus, to that to that place. He's talking about the fact that the Christian life is radically different. It's, it's a dangerous calling, as, as Paul Tripp calls it. it. It's a life of sacrifice. It's a life of service and other person's centeredness and, and serving the Lord. But, but please, says Paul, you tell me, why would I live that way if the dead aren't raised? He's saying, help me out here, guys. It doesn't make sense. What is the benefit of living a life like that if death wins? Uh, follow it with me there in verse 32. He goes on, if the, if the dead are not raised, let's, let's eat and drink for, for tomorrow. We, we die. In other words, if our view of death is the same as everyone else's, let's just have the same approach as everyone else. Get the most for yourself, a squeeze, the, the, the ring the most you can out of life, the few short days you've got. Eat and drink and get into your bucket list. Uh, ring the best, the most out of every second for, you know what, tomorrow we're dead. Tomorrow we're, we're, we're no more. Why not do that? But, but we don't. No, he says, we, we don't live that way. Why not? Because of the resurrection. And here's the difference. Uh, because of the resurrection of Jesus, it's not uh, life and then death. It's death and then life. Uh, it's completely different. Rory Shiner, in his book, uh, Raised Forever, he, he writes this. He says, the problem with the world is that it's far too conservative. It might look radical, but so deeply, deeply submissive. So horribly, embarrassingly wedded to the ancient regime of sin, death and Satan. It says to death, you win, sir. I understand that, and I don't mean to argue or to appear insubordinate, but would it be okay if I play a little first? That's not what we say, sir. Paul, Paul, Paul says. No, Jesus' resurrection brings a, a new approach to death, and it's that new attitude, that new approach to death, that, that new relationship we have with death, death that leads to a new and better life. Um, see, if, if death wins, then life really must be a, about desperately scratching for what you can get and what you can get in it. And, and, and in that sense, selfishness kind of makes sense. And insecurity is par for the course. And figuring out who I am and whether or not I have any value is actually quite difficult. In that scenario, even if the best of times are, are tinged with that sense of ultimate meaninglessness, that then what about the worst of times? And so uh, life ends up being uh, a sophisticated set of coping me mechanisms. But because you know what, what, what Yoda says is true, but if, if Jesus defeated death, 
And if I'm going to be raised like him, if already even in this life now, that, that if, that's, if I'm already on that trajectory, that glorious trajectory, then even the worst of days is infused with hope. That, that, that's a lot. That's, that's a new and better future, isn't it? A new, better life. My mistakes aren't quite as catastrophic in that case. It doesn't matter so much if I compare badly to others. I, I don't have to fight and scrap and wrestle because this is all there, there is. What a relief that is. In a sense, I'm actually released from the terrible burden of being my own advocate. I'm released to be able to give myself away, to be able to be generous. You know, at the end of the day, I wonder if that's not a more rewarding and meaningful and fulfilling life anyway. If you look at Paul again, he spends half his days in prison, uh, half his day, the other half of his days fighting opponents, the, the other half being shipwrecked and, and hungry. <laughs> I know that doesn't add up, but that's how he lives. I'm sure he goes fishing with the boys a few days, but in light of the resurrection, he says, take a look at my life. And he says, this is living. This is living. So you see, the gospel is the thrilling invitation to come out from those who are dying and to get into the trenches trenches with those who are really living. Now, I think the last point is I want to finish by talking about the new and better future. And by talking about the new and better future, I mean our new and better bodies. Just the bit that Paul talks about here. And as we do that, will you let yourself just indulge for a few minutes. Just let yourself think about it. What will it be like to have a resurrected body? What will it be like to live in a recreated world? Think about it. It's a world that the one who knows you and who knows what makes you tick, who created your true and authentic self, has prepared, as we saw last week from the foundation of the world. What will it be like? I think the short answer is you can't imagine it. In fact, the fact that you can't imagine it is what's thrilling about it. Uh, you've heard the phrase, haven't you? You had to be there. Uh, we use that phrase and it's our way of saying, I can't put it into words. You just had to be there. I can't do justice to it in, in words. And the picture of our new bodies and, and the new creation, it, it, it's a bit like that. You, you'll have to be there. But we do get some hints. And uh, Paul uses uh, some illustrations here to, to help us, from illustrations from what we know to at least give us a bit of a whiff. Uh, so the first thing is that there's some hints when it comes to Jesus' body. Um, Paul says there, the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead. It calls him the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. It's a farming term uh, which talks about the first part of the, the harvest. I've just picked uh, the first harvest of, of my raspberry bush. I'm excited because I've been waiting such a long time. I've, now I've tasted it and I've, I've seen it. And now I know what's coming, which is more of the same. And Jesus is the first fruits in, in that sense. So, so our new bodies, those who belong to him, they'll be like his. So what's that like? Well, for one, it's a, it's a body. It's not a ghost. It's not a, a floaty cloud thing. It, it, there's hands and feet and stuff. Uh, but Jesus somehow walks into a locked room. That's different. <laughs> he can eat. That's similar. That, that's good. Chance that, that I'll, I'll still get coffee and drink coffee in my new body. <laughs> Jesus is recognisable, but not identical. It takes his friends a while to figure out, yeah, that's really him. It's the same, but different. So there's a, there's a few hints in Jesus him, himself, but, but listen to Paul, because he's itching to know what you want to know. Uh, he says there, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fair question. Especially when our bodies are going to 
the K. What, what's, what, how's that work? Have you ever played that game where you say, how, how old do you think you'll be in heaven? And I always just think, oh, as long as I'm not as old as my mum, <laughs> that'll be okay. <laughs> Sorry, mum. Uh, but listen to Paul. No, he says, you, you foolish person. What you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. He's talking to farmers. He's saying, you know how it is in the plant world. You don't plant a seed and hold a funeral. A death is not what you expect. A death is not the end in that case. It's the beginning. And you know, too, verse 37, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel or perhaps of wheat or some, some other grain. Of course it is. You know that. that. That's what it's like. So it goes seed, plant. Wheat seed, wheat grass. Mango seed, mango tree. That's, that's how it is. But God gives it a body as he's chosen into each kind of seed, its own body. Uh, now, we start with seeds. If you've got your Bibles open there, we start with seeds. But all of a sudden, Paul uh, expands into every kind of other thing. Birds and fish and, 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 and stars and the sun and the, and the moon. All these things that have a, a different kind of a, a, a glory. And he says, even one star differs from another in, in glory. He's sort of lost in his own world there for a minute. He's just thinking about all the amazing bodies and there's a real challenge in, in, in that as you think, oh, look, how could, how could God raise the dead? How could he do that? Paul said, look around you. <laughs> look at the variety. Look at the intricacy. Look at the multiplicity of things. And then, then let that challenge your uncertainty about what can do, God can do. And then he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Uh, you know what, best I can do, says Paul, you have to be there. <laughs> uh, what is sown perishable, he says, uh, what is raised is imperishable. It's sown in dishonour, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness and it's raised in power. Now look, we haven't even got to Revelation 20. To today, uh, which talks about the city of God and the crowning jewel, the fact that God will be there himself. So in a way, we're, we're just wetting the whistle. But let's jump to the last bit, uh, uh, 51, where we were this morning. Uh, Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall all, not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. That, that's the new and better future for the people of God. And at that point, he says, we won't cuddle death. We won't succumb to it. Death will be swallowed up in, in victory. Isn't that a great picture? In your face, death. O oh, death, where is your victory? Now, where is your sting? Uh, and, and we come back down to the reason f for all this. Why do we need to, to know? Why, why, why is he reminding us? Well, because they're therefore my beloved brothers. He says, be steadfast, not movable immovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. We have a new and better king who's guaranteed a new and better future. The best thing you can do is to live life in light of that. Let me pray. Lord, for some of us, uh, maybe we've not thought about this much. For some of us, we've thought about it a lot, but it's great to be reminded of the truth of the gospel, that we have a new and better king who stepped into the chaos of this world, who put himself uh, in a place of danger, who died on a cross and who rose again. Thanks, Lord, that uh, that has a connection with us, that we can have a new approach to death and we'll live life differently 
that we'll have a body like his. Lord, help us to make that connection between Jesus and ourself and ourselves. Uh, help us to live in such a way that our lives say something about what you've done. Lord, give us strength and courage, sober judgment, an ability and a willingness to, to live that way in a world that, that, that doesn't want to see it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.